Okay, so now it is time. Feel free to keep eating, you know, your stuff that's on your table. Um, we are going to start our demonstrations. And so our first demonstration is um, Deanna. And for those of you who don't know, Deanna runs our um, bookstore area here at the church. Yes, such a blessing. And so she's going to tell us a little bit about how that works. And you're going to want to get your booklets out and kind of follow along. The whole idea for this was for you to know some great resources that you might, of course, like for yourself. Because I don't know if, and also for Christmas. You know, when you go shopping for Christmas, do you like go, oh, I'm going to buy this for so-and-so, but I'm going to buy one for me too. So you might be doing that with some of these things um, through Deanna. So we made it. Um, all the stuff's in there, but we also made it really easy for you. There's an order sheet, so you can just kind of tally up how many um, you want of things. And so she's going to explain all of that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and let Deanna get started. not a library. It, uh, <laughs> people think that that's what it is, um, and I wish that we had a library. That would be fun. Um, so the bookstore is um, something that has been around for a while. Barbara and Amanda used to, to run a little table during uh, service, you know, after and before services when we were at FLMs, and then when we were at the other schools, it would be a table that got set up and torn down every week. So now that we're here, we have a permanent area, and so it's great. Uh, and the way that it works is, you know, you buy what you want. There's envelopes um, on the wall that you just put your money in and drop it in the tithe box, your check, whatever. Um, or credit cards can be taken at the front counter. If I'm back there, you can pay me with a credit card if you want. Um, and the other thing is, is we do special orders as well. Normally, this is the card that you would use. Um, or you can write down my email address, and it's pretty easy. It's dgarcia at ccgreenvalley.org. Um, and that would be the fastest way for me to get your order, because sometimes I don't see these things out there. Um, so what happened is Amber gave me a list of books that she saw at the Pastor's Wives Retreat, and she's like, I think that these are all going to be fun, and, and it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Um, and she told me I have 12 minutes, so I better go. <laughs> so I'm just going to go and order from smallest book to biggest book. There's no rhyme or reason for it. Um, and so the first one is a little pot of oil. Um, this little book, three chapters, very easy to read. Um, in those three chapters, the author shares the importance of being filled with God and the power of his Holy Spirit. Um, we've all been through times of feeling low or empty, and we need that refreshment. Um, and it, it kind of gets us through 2 Kings chapter 4, where um, we got that pot of oil, that empty pot that seemed to be refilled constantly. Um, so... This one I'd recommend for as an encouragement for any believer, anybody who's going through um, just any kind of trial. I think this one is great. It's easy to read. Um, it doesn't require, you know, full attention. You're going to get into it, but it's not something like if you've got other things going on, um, you can read this. This one, though, Radical Prayer by Manny Mill. Um, you may have seen his testimony or heard of him. And if you haven't, I would Google him and watch a couple of his his YouTube videos, he's, he's a dynamic speaker. Um, got a little accent, so you have to try to, to adjust to it. Um, this man was sentenced to prison, 55 years to prison, um, for, you'll see in his testimony. Um, so it's encouraging for those who have a loved one who has been going through something like that. I have um, a brother-in-law who I'm waiting for his testimony to to be developed, you know, he's in this spot. And so this is encouraging for me. Um, and it's probably something I'm going to send to him. Um, so he's seen the power of prayer, bold and persistent prayer is what he says. Um, and he teaches those basics while sharing stories of prayers answered um, throughout the book. And these are all great uh, stories. So I recommend this book. This is captivating. That's what I wrote. <laughs> um, next, I have The Overcoming Life. Um, the Overcoming Life, written by D.L. Moody. This was written in 1896, so it's a classic. It's timeless. Um, takes you, um, the reader, believe it or not, through what it means to be saved. Then it takes us through the practical issues to help us become, um, be overcomers, overcomers of advers the adversary, sin, pride, covetousness, and so on. Um, our outlook looks bleak to many in this day, you know, to some with the whole political stuff going on. 
Um, but he wants us to remember that God is on the throne. And this is a good book just for today. Um, give it to someone again for encouragement. Okay, so somebody was asking me if I could pick one book on this stack, what would I pick? And I'd pick this one. Uh, the Songs of Jesus by Timothy Keller. Um, and this is the popular thing, it's Psalms. I'm always being asked about book of Psalms. Do I have anything? And this is it. This is a devotional for the entire year. And it'll get you through every single psalm. It breaks it up, you know, some days, little by little. Um, it gives you three ways of using the book. So even if you use it one way the first year and the next year you use it a little differently, um, you can reuse it. Um, the first way is to read it through as it is written and use the prayer to begin praying the psalm yourself. Or you can take the time to look up the additional scripture references that are in here. Um, or the, the third way is to journal and answer three questions. What did you learn about God for which you could praise or thank him? What did you learn about yourself for which you could repent? What did you learn about your life that you could aspire to ask for or act on? So if you give this one out and you want them to use it the third way, get a journal as well. So they can journal all that. <laughs> um, okay. On um, being a servant of God. Um, I'll admit this book did not catch my eye at first, and I, I hate to say it. I judged a book by its cover. Um, and I, I did. This was one of the last ones I opened up, and I was wrong. I needed to do this one first. Um, so it just was encouraging for my ministry. It was encouraging for um, my ministry here. I have another ministry as well. So just between those two things, um, I needed this. And so I'm not selling this particular one. This is mine. <laughs> um, so it's a short book filled with godly wisdom, easy to read. This man has been through years and years of ministry, so he's seen it all, he's felt it all, he's done it all, and it's encouraging. Um, so whether it's for somebody who's serving now or, you know, whatever ministry, I, it can be not for a pastor, it's not just for, for anybody. So, like that one. I need that one. Okay, so missional motherhood. Um, I'm a mom. Got five kids and two son-in-laws. Um, so this, is, this is author is an American woman, uh, but she lives in Dubai, which is pretty interesting. Um, and she breaks the book up into two parts. Uh, the first part is motherhood and the grand plan of God. And it shows us the foundation for missional motherhood by giving an overview of the word of God with an emphasis for God's pattern for motherhood and his promises regarding his plan. And then the second part um, is just the everyday ministry of motherhood. And you will see ways Christian moms around the world to display God's pattern and claim God's promises as they make Christ's disciple out of their children. Uh, one of the lines from the book, um, it, it was just, I loved it. It's Christ's image that we are trying to embody as we plant fields, judge the cases, fly the planes, organize the data, paint the paintings, feed the hungry, sweep the kitchen, pave the roads, diaper the babies, build the cities, and resist evil. Um, I can just see this is a way of connecting moms. So if you have a fellow mom that you um, spend time with or you just call on the phone, I think if you got this one for you and your friend, and you could just go through it. It's not a Bible study, but you could read a chapter and then talk about it, um, or as a book club choice. I like that one. All right, which none can shut. This is um, a woman who lives in Arab. She um, is an American woman living in um, Arab. She moves around, so I can't say what city she lives in right now, and it's not even her real name that's as the author, because obviously she would be um, in trouble. <laughs> Um, and so she just shares all of the stories about um, how she's sharing the Lord with those Muslim women, um, and sometimes Muslim w uh, men. There's one story in here that's very interesting, um, and I won't share it with you because you need to read it. Um, so I just love that one. This one I read in one sitting because I loved it. Uh, and I'm a reader. So <laughs> Chuck Smith's Living Water. Um, this one flies off the shelf a lot. Um, it's just, t he takes us who th through who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and how we should respond to the Holy Spirit. Um, and if you've ever had questions about the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of being, um, and the difference being born of the Holy Spirit and being back baptized, this, is, this book is for you. Um, and one of the examples that's in the book, he is teaching summer camp to, to a bunch of kids in Arizona, and he cut off an apple tree branch that was full of unripened apples. He told the youth he was speaking to that he could, couldn't wait until those apples were ready to eat in a couple months. The kids snickered and told him that they would never be ready to eat 
And he tells them, what do you mean they won't get ripe, I asked. Look at them. They look great. And boy, I can't wait until September when they get ripe. Maybe I will even make apple pie. Uh, and they, they laughed at him. And he said, it's the same way in your spiritual life. You will never develop if you are cut off from the life of the Spirit. Just as the branch draws its nourishment and energy from the vine, so do you from the Spirit. It is through the Spirit that God's life flows through you. It is in the realm of the Spirit that you come into contact with God. So, just full of Chuck Smith. It's good. <laughs> Girl in the Song, another book I read in one sitting. Uh, maybe one and a half because it was not my time. Um, this is a memoir. If you've ever heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle and their choir, um, Chrissy, Chrissy Simbala Toledo, it's her parents. Her dad was a pastor. Her mom's the choir director. Um, and you would think that pastor's child, everything was good, but she just went down a, the wrong path. And it all started with TV shows like Happy Days, music, Madonna, or not Madonna, um, it was Prince she talked about, and movies like Grease. And it just became that she needed to be this, she had this image of how the world perceived her to be, that she needed to be. Um, and so everybody, she knew everybody was looking at her. She knew that she had the attention of people until there was one young man who didn't give her the attention she thought she needed. And so she sought that attention and did whatever she could take do to get it. Um, you'll just see she went down a long path, um, had a baby out of wedlock, still tried to get to this guy. Um, and it just shows how God uses her. Um, I was a, a teen mom myself, so I love this book. I can see this for any young mother, especially because it, to me, it shows exactly what movies and TV shows and music can do to our youth, um, even when you think it's innocent. You know, those, the way she tells it is, is good. Okay, this is a good devotional here. This is a 26-week 20 week, 20 study. Each week is devoted to studying and praying a particular name of God. Um, Anne Spang Spangler has set the week up um, this way. I was going to read this page really quick. So Monday is devoted to reading and studying. It provides a scripture pas passage that reveals the name, background information, and a brief Bible study to help you understand the name. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday can um, our devotional readings to help you pray specific scripture passages that contain the name or relate closely to it. The devotional readings are meant to, um, as a springboard for your own prayer. It will help you keep your Bible, help to keep your Bible handy while reflecting on the relevant scripture passages. And fr Friday helps you reflect on, reflect on how the name connects to God's promises in scripture. So good little one, 26 weeks, half a year. Easy to do. Okay, so this one. I brought color pencils up because if you're giving this as a gift, you need the color pencils because it's going to encourage you to write, draw, color, journal, whatever in this book. Um, it's great. I love it. Everything is in here. So if you, you know, I bring my Bible with me everywhere I go, but some people don't. And if so, if you just bring this with you to the dentist's office and your color pencils, scriptures in there already printed for you. Everything's in here that you need for 28 days. Um, easy gift. Um, and last one, my favorite, I do have two married daughters as of this summer. Um, I did give this to one. The other one, I haven't bought one for her yet, uh, so don't tell her. Um, <laughs> so, and it's not just for new brides. I didn't come from a Christian home. I was reading through this book, and I found things in here that I could learn from, um, things that I wish I had learned in the beginning of my marriage, things that I could still use now. It doesn't relate just for new brides. It goes through all the way. Uh, Barbara Rainey, you've heard of them for Family Life Ministries. She's you know, they've been through a lot of things, and it goes through their years of marriage and what they've learned. Um, so, love this book. You can't have this one either. Uh, <laughs> so, we also have Bibles back there. Um, there's little Bibles, there's big Bibles, there's large print. You could probably read them all the way at the back. Eddie can probably read some of the large print ones I have. Um, and some people need that, and that's fine. Um, so, we have the Chuck Smith Bibles word for today for study. Um, and there's so many different covers. There's paperback, there's hardback, there's leather. So I couldn't give you a, a price on those. There's, it's whatever you choose. Um, full of his little insights for different verses. Um, and there's even one that's just a New Testament that people um, love. It's a good gift. Um, and then we have the life application. And these ones have really pretty covers too. This one will come in large print as well. Um, it's whatever you prefer. Sometimes they have the index things already on there, the cheaters, as Lloyd likes to call them. Um, so 
think that's it. So you have your order form if you want to prepay and order anything this week. Um, it would be helpful if you ordered it today. Christmas is coming up, um, which means some things run out pretty quick. So if you want to put an order in, please do so. Um, I think that's it. Constantly going, okay, I need this book and that book. And I love one of the things that they told us um, when I was just at this pastor's wives conference this past fall. And she said, you know, you think that, um, that I have a lot of time to read. And she says, I don't. And um, the girl who was sharing it is like me. She also has, um, she also has three boys. And so she said, I just read intentionally. And, um, and so she just brings her book with her wherever she goes, kind of like Deanna said, and you just have it. And then when you have 10 minutes here or five minutes there, you can use it to be growing in your walk with the Lord. And I think, um, you know, we have our quiet times and we have our Bible study, but there's so much to be learned in addition to from these different books and different people who have lived and just whatever you're going through. There's probably a book about that somebody's written that is going to minister to you. And so... Um, so I would encourage you and just however the Lord led in that. Um, but like I said, I do have a couple and, um, Carolyn is going to come up now and she is going to be telling us, um, hospitality for the holidays. When you have a guest and, um, they come over to your house, how can you just make them feel loved and special and appreciated, um, that's the heart of the Lord, and um, I know it's the heart of John for this church is just hospitality, and so we want to take some good notes, and I know she has some stuff in here too, so I'll let you um, take over from now. So I love this saying, um, hospitality is not about inviting people into your perfect home. It's about inviting them into your heart. What hospitality is not, several things. It is not entertaining to impress. It is not channeling Martha Stewart. You do not need the perfect home, the matching dishes, um, the great bouquet. Um, it shouldn't be stressful. And um, it's just about giving the gift to somebody. Um, hospitality is something that happens in your heart before it ha ever happens in your home. It is fellowship with fellow believers, and it is also ministry to non-believers. It is a form of giving and it should be done with joy. Peter, uh, 1 Peter 4, 9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And Romans 12, 13 commands us to contribute to the needs of the saints and to seek to show hospitality. So whether you're hosting a meal or overnight guest, there are several things that you can um, do to make it uh, fun. So the first thing you wanna do is pray because um, we need the Lord's assistance in all things we do to do it unto him. And then you want to plan, because if you fail to plan, you will plan to fail. So um, if you're having children, if, you, if you're inviting another family over and you, you know that they've got kids, make sure you have something for them to do, to involve them. Um, an activity or maybe have them help you spray the whipped cream on the dessert or you know decorate cookies make sugar cookies and have a little table set up for them to decorate and um, puzzles puzzles are great my family when my kids were little we always had a card table that we would set up in the house and we would put a, ta a puzzle on it at Thanksgiving and our goal was to finish it by Christmas and so everybody that came over we would invite them to help us with our goal and we would have people sitting there for five minutes. We would have people that would just walk by and put a puzzle piece in. Um, and we would work on it in the evenings with our kids as we watched Christmas movies. And we always finished it by Christmas. And as the kids were young, we did an easy puzzle. And as they got older, they got more pieces. <laughs> and they got harder. But it was always a fun thing, and my kids remember it. Um, and you don't have to make everything from scratch. Plan on semi-homemade right? Make the dish you enjoy making. If you like making savory and you want to make the main dish, buy the desserts, buy the sides. If you are a baker and you just want to make cheesecake or whatever, and there we live in a town of a million restaurants that all do takeout, and so you can buy the main dish. You don't have to make it all from scratch. 
And I have done that. I just recently did this. My husband, we were, I was running around, and I have a freezer full of meat. It's, it's a confession here. But I was running around. I haven't bought anything. And so I was at Costco, and I thought, oh, so buco. So I grabbed an oso buco, went home, put it in my baking dish, shoved it in the oven for 30 minutes, whipped up some mashed potatoes, steamed some broccoli. He came home and he was like, whoa, this is good. And he took it the next day to work and he was bragging to the guys, I've got this oso buco my wife made. And I said, honey, Costco made it. I didn't make it. So, <laughs> so it doesn't have to be from scratch. You can also host a potluck. Invite people, have a theme dinner and invite people to come over and be a part of your thing. Potluck. People love to bring something um, if they feel involved. Um, if you're worried about conversation, how do I keep the conversation moving? Those lull points that kind of seem a little like dry and you're like, uh-oh. Have a game. Have a question like we did for our pumpkin um, stories. And another thing, people love to talk about themselves. They love to share. They, they, you're, you're interested. You're asking them what's going on in your life. And they will talk. And a good thing to always ask believers and non-believers is how can we be praying for you? Um, they leave knowing you're praying for them. And I have found that even non-believers, if you ask them how can I be praying for you, they will tell you because they see that you're a praying person. Um, so that's um, the conversation. What about overnight guests? So you've invited people and they're staying for the weekend. And you, a couple of things that I like to do is I love to have a basket with their um, towels in it on their bed so that when they come, they know these are their towels. Not only is it great display and looks good, but when they're done with the towels and they leave, they can put them in the basket, and often they'll carry it down to the laundry room for me. <laughs> so, so the basket of towels is a great thing. Also, internet. You can use a little frame. You can, this is a top of a glass thing, but you can just put your internet and, and invite them, you know, your password, and invite them to be free to be online in your home. Um, the bathroom. People always forget something. I'm always forgetting something. And so I like to just have an array of things that people might forget, like some shampoo and conditioner, bath powder, bath salts if they want to have a bath, some soap, lotion, hairspray, as women we forget our hairspray, um, a shower cap, a new shower cap, and you know if they've used it, you know, even hotels give you shower caps now. Um, take it with you. It, give it to them as a gift. Uh, I have a little manicure kit, toothbrush, toothpaste, floss. Um, and uh, a razor blade and a razor because a lot of times people will forget the razor. So just a little array of things that people might forget in their bath, you know, in the bathroom that is set up so that they know that that's for them to use. That if you've forgotten something, help yourself. Um, I also like to, we have extra chargers. Sometimes people forget their chargers and we're all in electronic age now. And so I like to just put a charger in their room and we have chargers for cameras and all kinds of different Fit. So it's just nice to have extra chargers around. Um, and so that you, you've got your meal, you've had dinner, they go to sleep, they wake up in the morning. Some people wake up really early. I've had guests that wake up at 5 a.m. and I do not. <laughs> so I like to have just a set out, a tray of things that people can help themselves to. They see it and they, it can help themselves. So a tea and some honey and some fun coffee toppers and coffee and sugar and, and uh, cocoa and fruit. If, if you put out fruit, people feel like they can help themselves, and that's always a great stack. So you can have a bowl of fruit sitting on the table, and people will help themselves. And then you can just have little snacky items out, too, if they want something to go with their coffee in the morning. You can have instant coffees, and um, it just helps people know that they can help themselves, and they feel at home. They're not going to rummage through your refrigerator, usually, unless they're family, but if you have it out, they will help themselves. I like to always leave a devotional in the bedroom, the guest bedroom, just for people in the morning if they're thinking about, you know, oh, I forgot my Bible. Or, you know, even non-believers will open up the devotional and, and read it. And they'll find that date, and so it's kind of fun. Um, and then um, I like to have um, something that people, you know, enjoy. Like, I like to know their dietary needs. But I also, you know, you have certain guests, and you know they enjoy things. And so one of the things that we have company that comes, and the husband is a tr true chocoholic. He loves chocolate. So when they come, I always break out special dishes for the season, and I always make sure I have plenty of chocolate laying around in the living room, so, you know, or the dining room, so that he knows he can help himself, because it's there to help yourself. And kids love that, too. <laughs> and then for breakfast. Breakfast comes, and you're thinking, well, we eat cereal. I mean... <laughs> 
or we don't do breakfast. And, but you've got this company you have to feed. So uh, Trader Joe's has the most amazing frozen croissant rolls. You literally take these little frozen things, put them on parchment paper in a cookie sheet, put them in your oven at night, don't turn it on, shut the door. When you wake up in the morning, they have risen, they're puffy, they're beautiful. You turn on that oven and you start baking croissants. They have chocolate and almond and all these great, and then regular croissants, and they will do, outdo any bake shop. They are so good. Um, Costco, Sam's Cubs, they all have those quiches that are ready-made, and you just pop them in the oven frozen, pop them in the oven 30 minutes, and you have fresh-baked quiche. When your guests come in the kitchen, you're slicing up fruit for them, and coffee's made, and they, they feel like they've been to a French bed and breakfast. Um, so breakfast can be easy. You don't have to rethink it. Stratas are great. Use old bread, make oven-baked French toast. There's all kinds of recipes online to help with easy breakfast. Um, and then uh, I like to um, plan the dinner ahead of time and make sure that I have everything on hand. If there's special dietary needs, I have that covered. Um, the goal of hospitality is to share love. And when people know you're thinking about them and making it special for them, they feel loved. Um, I love how Pastor John saying, Success is the amount of God's love flowing into us and out of us. And, and when you want, if you want to have successful hospitality, just let that happen, and people will enjoy being in your home. If you're relaxed and you enjoy your company, they will enjoy being with you. And so the, there's a lot of excuses we make for not being hospitable and not inviting people over. You know, my house is too small. It's never clean. My dogs bark at everybody. Um, you know, all those things, there are practical solutions to. Your house doesn't have to be big. We did not have a huge house. And one Thanksgiving, I invited um, a people from church over. We usually had people over from church that didn't live in the area and didn't have family. Or they lived there, but they didn't have family. And so we would all gather together at our house and just have our holidays together. And um, there was a new couple in church, and the Lord led me to invite them. That put the count at 30. And I was like, okay, Lord, I don't have a big house. I don't have a dining room for 30 people. <laughs> so we took all the furniture out of the family room, and we stretched out those long six-foot tables, and we had 30 people sitting together in one room. And what a blessing it was. Um, and I had friends that made the centerpieces, and everybody brought dishes. It wasn't like I cooked for 30. I went and bought a honey-baked ham, you know, so... <laughs> So, but it was fun, and it was, it was just good fellowship. And um, also just asking people about their traditions when you're having people over in the holidays. Um, the couple that the Lord led me to invite, she had a special tradition. Now, this was Easter, but she was from Denmark, and her family always threw an egg, now this is a cooked egg, over the house. So one person would stand on one side of the house, the other person would stand on the other, so one in the backyard, one in the front yard, and I, ha I cooked up the eggs. And so we told everybody at the dining room table that we're going to do something special. It's Susie's family tradition. And we're going to throw eggs over the house. So get a partner. Now, I had a two-story house. So I uh, said, so get a partner. The teenagers per um, participated. The little kids threw eggs over the fence from front yard to backyard. We had eggs flying everywhere. And um, it was really fun. And she felt at home because we had done her family tradition. And the teens loved getting up on my roof and getting all the eggs off of it that had crumbled on the shingles. So anyhow, there's lots of ideas for hosting. You can host a cookie exchange. That's easy. You make one type of cookie. You have everybody bring their recipe. I mean, there's instructions online for it, but it, it can be easy. Um, soup exchange. You could do that with your neighbors. Um, we had a pizza party uh, last year, and all I did was make little, like, dinner plate pizza skins. We provided the sauce, we provided the cheese, and we told everybody, bring a topping. And we had all these wonderful toppings. And so what we did is each skin was for a couple. So the couples had to work together to decide what they wanted on their pizza, and then we cooked them on our barbecue grill. We didn't even heat up the house. And it was a hit. Everybody loved it. They're like, do this again. So it was easy. You know, ice cream. Invite people over for ice cream and have them bring different toppings and just have a dessert. Um, you can invite friends over for um, popcorn in a movie. You don't even have to make a meal. You can do microwave popcorn. Um, a 
cook-off. We've had cook-offs before, chili cook-off, soup cook-off, a cake cook-off. You, know, you can just, and you can have girlfriends over and um, just enjoy our weather, sit outside, you know, enjoy each other's a pie cook-off. There's lots of things you can do. You could do with anything. Um, in the holiday season, you can have people over for card addressing, card making, get the kids involved, lots of glitter. Everybody loves glitter. Um, and listen to Christmas music and drink hot cocoa. And you can do this again with friends, and you can also do it with neighbors. This is how you can open up your heart to invite someone in. Um, this time of year can be really joyful, uh, gathering with friends and family. But for some people, it can be awfully lonely. Um, and so um, pray about opening up your home to somebody who just might need the gift of hospitality. Think about the widows. My mom lost my dad last year, and this has probably been one of the loneliest years she's ever experienced. And I think we, you know, we have a lot of widows in our church. And where do they go for the holidays? Do they get invited over for a special dinner? You know, that's something to think about, how God might use you in their life to bless them, because we are all family. Um, Hebrews 13.2 states, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels. There's some great books on hospitality. Uh, one I highly recommend is Open Heart, Open Home uh, by Karen Maines. Uh, there's Practical Hospitality. She gives you biblical support of why we do it and recipes, and that's by Pat Ennis. And also The Art of Hospitality by Yvonne Baker. It's very practical. It's filled with recipes, menu plans. Um, and then there's a great website that I've gotten a lot of information off of, and it's feathersinournest.com. She's a pastor's wife, and she has the gift of hospitality. And, and to be hospitable, you don't need the gift of hospitality because God calls us all to be hospitable. And if he calls us, he will equip us. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for leading us in that beautiful worship, Elvia. That was just beautiful. Well, I'm, I was um, given the task of talking about personal relationships this morning, and um, we certainly have a lot of personal relationships that go on during Thanksgiving, and um, some that are really difficult and messy. So I'm, I, God just gave me a message on... Um, what we can do in those messy relationships. But first, I'd like to share a, a true story with you, and some of you may have heard this before. It relates back to World War I, and it was in 1914, five months into the, the, world, the breakout of World War I, and there was a Christmas truce that was called in several pockets on the Western Front, which was all the way from northern Belgium down to southern France. The rifles stopped firing and the sound of bullets faded into the night air and Christmas carols began being sung on both sides of the um, lines, enemy for enemy, singing with one another. And this went on throughout the entire night. And then on Christmas morning, um, the Allies saw the enemies getting up out of the trenches and at first they thought this was a, a trick and that they were going to be ambushed but they saw that they came out of those trenches without any weapons in their hands. So the Allies also began to come out of the trenches, and they met together in the middle, shook hands, and then they shared cigarette gifts with one another and plum pudding, and they sang some more carols together. And there's even a documented story of a really friendly game of football, which is um, soccer in our United States, between some of the um, Allies and their enemies. But at the end of that day, the truce ceased, the war raged for three more years, and that never happened again. I just thought that was such an inter interesting story of um, humanity coming together for a moment in the midst of uh, the, the greatest difficulties. Well, Thanksgiving, for many, can be like that. They get together for Thanksgiving. They call a truce for a few hours, even though they've got a lot of issues going on with some of the people at the Thanksgiving dinner. And then when the holiday's over, truce is over, and they are really thankful to be done until the next gathering. And quite honestly, relationships are just plain messy and really difficult at times because we all struggle with our flesh, with our sin nature, which wants its own way, and it wants it now, and it wants what it wants. 
And the fact is that any of our relationships that hold together and flourish are all a sure sign of God's mercy and grace and his work in each one of us. Look at all the messy relationships that we're um, reading about in Lineage of the King. There's lying, there's manipulation, there's a lot of favoritism going on, stealing, thoughts of murder. That's just to mention a few of the things. But God worked in these relationships, changing, molding, and shaping individuals into vessels that could be used for his glorious purposes. And I think that our own relationships are not, not so different from those. We may have a child that's in rebellion, a friend that's become distant. Maybe there's hurtful gossip going on, critical comments from a friend or a family member, or those that are quick to give their opinions and their unsolicited advice that may irritate us. There's battles over inheritances between families, wills that will divide people. And most recently, we've had deep, deep political divides between families and friends. I'm sure if we paused a moment and thought about it, we could each think of a relationship that we have that fits into to this list of difficult relationships. Personally, I've seen a battle playing out in my own extended family over at Thanksgiving dinner. There's a young couple that's been um, hostessing, hosting Thanksgiving dinner for three years now, and I was listening to Carolyn and thinking, just that they love hosting Thanksgiving. The husband and wife do it together, they go shopping together, they do all the cooking together, they set up the house together, they have all kinds of fun things planned. So they had in their minds that this was going to become a Thanksgiving tradition. Everyone in the extended family would come to their home. But they got a rude awakening this year when they were told that another family member is going to do Thanksgiving at their house this year. So unfortunately, there's a lot of anger and hurt and even threats not to go to Thanksgiving dinner this year. A large dose of humility, grace, and forgiveness is re really needed right now in that relationship. When we're confronted, confronted with difficult relationship issues, we can feel like shutting down, lashing out, getting even with them, or even getting out of the situation. But the better choice for us is to recognize that God has the last word in all of these conflicted relationships. Just as with all those characters that we're studying in the lineage of the king, he's going to work in our messy relationships to change, to mold, and to shape us into the women who will reflect his love and mercy more fully and to become vessels for his higher purposes as we submit ourselves to him and allow him to do that refining work in us. Our human tendency, though, is to focus on the problem, right? The pain, my injured feelings, failures that have happened in the relationship, rather than looking to the good that God is accomplishing through it. Joseph is just such a great example of God at work in messy relationships, right? He was thrown in a pit. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. He spent two years in prison for crimes he didn't commit. And yet, when he came face to face with his brothers years later, he poured out love, kindness, mercy, and forgiveness on them. God used all of those circumstances to teach Joseph humility, to strengthen his character, and to deepen Joseph's relationship with God himself. Joseph came through all of that understanding the goodness and grace of God in his life, even through or maybe because of the pain, suffering, and hardship that he had gone through. Joseph exhibits to us godly love and kindness in those actions. God was so moved by love that he sacrificed his only son for us when we were still filthy rags, sinners, probably not even thinking of the need for forgiveness so that he could have a relationship with his people. And Jesus so loved his father that he obediently went to the cross for us. Joseph was moved by godly love to forgive all of the injury that had been done to him, even though they had not asked for or deserved any forgiveness. So my question is, are we loving others with a love that moves us to action? It's going to require us to put to death our selfish desires, maybe several times in a day, humbling ourselves in order to move with love and kindness in all those messy relationships that God has, with, has for us. The love Joseph extended is no ordinary love. It's a love that is directed by God. And we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in that godly love. 
when we give the Holy Spirit room to move in our lives, when we seek to make our desires God's desires, the Holy Spirit even guides us into that and brings glory to God through all of it. When we are motivated by his love, it is going to push us to express kindness and mercy, to move in love even when it hurts. The Apostle Paul spent a lot of time on relationships. In all of his epistles, he talks of relationships. And his desire was for unity as he expressed to the believers in his Ephesians letter. He's urging us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling with humility, with kindness, with patience, and showing tolerance for one another in love. Although we don't have that unity of mind and spirit with our unbelieving relatives and friends, we are still to walk in that humility and kindness, loving them and reflecting Jesus to them and praying always for their salvation. Humility is needed oh so much in our relationships, and it's the very opposite of pride, which we seem to have plenty going around. It's, it, pride happens to be one of the single biggest causes of much of the conflict or at least one of the main reasons that conflict issues aren't resolved. I have a family member who hasn't spoken to her sisters, her two sisters for 17 years. She was the executor of the will for their father and the other sisters didn't trust her and didn't believe that she was doing things the way that they should be done. And so a lot of um, angry words were spoken, a lot of hurt came from it, there was gossip among all the other family members and to this day they don't speak. And I've had conversations with all of them. The one says that the other two don't deserve forgiveness and she'll never give it. And the other two have said they've tried to reach out. And by the way, the other two are believers. And they said, I've tried to reach out, I've thought about it, I've gotten all the way to her doorstep and then I just couldn't do it. And I, I just look at that with such, um, such a saddened heart because they're missing out and they're also in the twilight of their years, and I just wonder, are they going to go to their graves with all of that unforgiveness and unresolved conflict in their re relationship? And they formerly loved one another dearly, so it just is heartbreaking. But it not only affects those three sisters, it affects all of the extended ma family members. All of their children are affected by it. So stubborn pride and fear of rejection I believe is what has left this relationship in tatters and left our family relationship in shreds. But putting love in action is going to be choosing to humble ourselves, to be encouraging, to stop the gossiping when it starts, to replace those ugly mean words and actions that tear us down with words of kindness and mercy to one another, not being judgy and critical, and especially asking the Lord to teach us to be humble vessels of his grace. I have another true story for you. Two women got together socially, and as soon as they sat down, one of the ladies looked at the other one and said, well, should we talk about Mary before she gets here today? Mary's not her real name, by the way. I know you laugh and you gasp. You know, that's pretty blunt. And I was thinking, wow, I can't believe she said that. But, you know, I thought about it, and under the surface, isn't that what we're thinking when we're heading into gossip? Just can't wait to get that something juicy out there? Well, to the other person's credit, she just simply said no and changed the topic as quickly as she could. But gossip truly does hurt relationships, and not just the person being gossiped about. It, it damaged that relationship between those two ladies as well. Do you struggle with judginess? I think most of us do at times. And I was visiting with a friend most recently, and she shared with me how she had, judged, had been judgy against a new acquaintance, and she was later deeply convicted by the Lord for her sin. She met this lady at her church, and she found that this woman had a very rough exterior and a very gruff demeanor. And they had done a couple things in ministry together, and she, my friend had become irritated by her gruff manner and by her bossiness when they were doing ministry. So she had made a judgment based on those two things about this lady. Well, as God would have it, they went to a women's retreat and they ended up sharing a room together. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this lady began sharing her testimony with my friend. And under that rough exterior was a woman who had been deeply hurt in her past and who also now had the most tender heart for the lost and hurting people. 
So that time together of listening and sharing has led to a blossoming, blossoming relationship with one another. And they're excited to do ministry together in the future. And I just say, why? Because God was moving in that relationship to accomplish his good purpose. And that was pretty quickly. Sometimes God moves and we don't see results for a long, long time. And so we should persevere in the waiting. As for myself, because yes, I have those sinful tendencies as well, I have a lot of opinions that I like to share. And boy, during this political season, it was very easy to get involved in all of that sharing of hot opinions. But this one happened a while back. We were at a gathering, and I was, there was a lot of sharing going on, and the topics were pretty hot topics, and I had a lot to say about it, and I was pretty much in opposition to everything that everyone else was sharing. And I don't really recognize sometimes when I'm excited about something or passionate about something that I can get louder and get more forceful. So <laughs> a family member pulled me aside and very vehemently said, stop, your opinions don't matter. Well, I was furious. <laughs> and I, I looked at him and said, what do you mean? My opinions don't matter. All of their opinions matter? What's going on here? But the truth of it is, and I have been convicted of it since, is that it really doesn't matter what my opinions are. It matters what God's opinions are. And it matters that I am reflecting him and that I'm pointing to people to Jesus when I speak to people. And it should be with love and with kindness. So I'll confess to you, it's still a problem I have. And God is still working that out in me and humbling me in that area. So are we contributing to difficulties in our relationships by holding on to unforgiveness? or being unwilling to take the first steps to reconcile, maybe by gossiping, or being judgy about others, or perhaps really sharing opinions as I have, or offering unsolicited advice. It's certainly the way of the world, and it's very easy for us to fall into that same pattern of behavior. So I encourage us to pray for the Lord to move in all of those areas that we struggle in. Paul not only exhorted believers in how to live in relationship, he was an also a, an example to us regarding prayer in relationships. Like Jesus, he was a man of prayer, and he prayed faithfully for the relationships in his life. We are exhorted to pray in that same way. So I encourage you to be faithful to pray over difficult relationships, asking the Lord to help you to pers persevere in love, in kindness, and in humility and to be filled with his mercy and grace. It may not change the difficult relationship, but it very well may change you. And I love something that Oswald Chambers said. To say that prayer changes things is not as close to the truth as saying prayer changes me and then I change things. Amen? Well, to, to, close, to close and wrap it all up, our, our greatest joy and our greatest pain is found in our relationships. And it truly was by God's design that we would have a need for these relationships. And he's going to use them, both the joyful and the painful, to change us and to conform us into vessels for his glorious purposes as we submit ourselves in love to his desires. So I say to you, may all of your thanksgivings be more than just a truce for a few, a few hours this year as we put to death our own fleshly desires and go out persevering in loving kindness and grace toward other, others in these coming days. Thank you so much, ladies. Let me just pray for us. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you have a desire to have a relationship with us. And Lord God, that you call us to love others and to be in relationship with them, Lord. But I confess, relationships can be difficult and gathering together at Thanksgiving can bo be both fun and joyous and um, tense and difficult, Lord God. So I just pray for each of us, Lord God, that we would just wrap ourselves in your love, Lord God, that we would submit ourselves to you, that we would continue to just um, cut that flesh each and every day, Lord God, and develop that desire to reach out and to love everyone, Lord God, with humility, with kindness, and with care, even when it may be hurtful to us, Lord God. We love you, and we lift this day up to you in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
Kendall to speak again. They all have done such a great job. Thank you so much. That was really good. And I loved, um, I loved how she was um, so transparent in telling us what's going on because we all have that stuff going on and if we act like we don't, then we can't even relate to each other, right? Because there's just so many different things. And um, we had a family member who didn't talk um, to the rest of us for, I wanna say about 16 years and, um, and we just kept praying for her and it was because she wasn't in a right place with the Lord and we talked about to her about something that she was doing and she didn't like it. So um, anyways, we, I got a letter one day from her out of nowhere because she started getting back with the Lord and started going to Bible study. And, um, and she also lives in Colorado and, um, and the Lord has reconciled and done. So, I mean, after 16 years, so you just never know what he's gonna do. So just keep praying that he's gonna work because when he enters in, the impossible becomes possible. So what you think couldn't happen can happen. So um, that's really exciting. So, all right, well, I did um, tell you all that I was gonna have a challenge for you because remember we're on break now until January. We have a very busy season. We have Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving coming up and Christmas and then you kind of have to take everything down and put it away in your house so we kind of wanted to give you um, that time so I think we start the second week of January but I definitely don't want you to you do have one lesson that you can do you know over that time so uh, but that shouldn't take you that long for sure and our first week back remember is a refresh and connect and so that's going to be really fun and um, so Susan is going to be doing the devotion on that, and that's going to be on Seasons of Mercy for the new year. So we're going to have some really fun stuff for that our first time back. And uh, so what I wanted to do is get out. If you don't already have your program out, I want you to write this down. And um, this is a great Bible study that you can do. You may have other things that you're doing, uh, but I had heard about it and heard about it and heard about it. And I just completed this. Um, I just kind of was doing it on my own time in addition to everything else and really enjoyed it. So what you do is you take the Gospel of John, and there's 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. So you can do like a chapter, you know, um, most days of the week or just kind of between now and January. You don't have to do it every day. But if you're like me, maybe you'll do the Gospel of John and then you'll move on to something else. But I heard John Corson say a while back that if you, that you need to be always in a Gospel because the Gospel teaches us about Jesus and Jesus is where it's all at. And so we need to be constantly looking to him. And then I heard some other people, um, you know, saying the same thing. I mean, he, you need to look at him at the way he handled things, at the way he handled people in situations. And we know that he had a lot of very awkward situations and circumstances with people. And so um, what we're looking for is, and I call it TNT, you know, because you think of dynamite power. So we're looking for two T's, the way he treated people and the way he talked to people. And so you are going to be looking for that. So you just sit down, you open up your Bible to chapter one of John and you look at, and you just put like a one, a two, you know, and a three. So you look at how, how did he talk to people? And then you note, how did he interact? What was the circumstance? What was the situation? How did he handle it? Just kind of explore that. And how did he treat people, you know, um, and the things and the way he, that he went out of the, his way for them and the things that he did and the way, you know, um, just, I don't want to say very much, just like Deanna, because I want you to write it down. And then what you can learn. So then I would just look at what I wrote from that chapter about how Jesus treated people, how he talked to them. And then I would write down, you know, what can I learn from that in my own life? And so it's a great little Bible study to do. You have 21 of them to do, or, you know, like... It didn't take me 21 days. I did more than one chapter a day. Um, but some chapters are longer, and then you have to break them up more. And another thing, if you want to do the bonus, which I did too, is write down all the names of Jesus that you find as you're going through there. And so then I marked those in my Bible and put a big box around them so that it sticks out so I can see Son of God. You know, I can see bread of life. I can see those things really clearly and um, they'll stick out. And um, you're just going to be so blessed as you do that. And I want you to tell me the ways that the Lord has blessed you as you're doing that. And I just have to do a plug. So Deanna, um, this is my favorite new thing 
that I have, and it is a pencil, but it's it looks like one pencil, but it's got all these different colors in it. So it has red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Um, it comes with pink. I bought purple to replace the pink. And so right now I have orange sticking out, so I can highlight, underline something in my Bible. Then you turn it upside down, and you pop the color down. You spin this to a different color, and out comes a different color. And so with one pencil, you can have all these colors, and so you can always have it in your Bible, and it's really easy. Um, so that's a really fun way to mark those different things that you saw, and um, I'm visual, and I like to be interactive with my Bible study. So if that's you, that is a great thing. Um, Deanna or does order them for the store. I think I bought the last ones that we had, but um, she can order more for you, and they have refills as well. So, um, so that is a great study. You're going to love it, love it, love it. And I'm just looking at our schedule right now because we definitely went over, over, over for um, what we had planned today. And so we're actually supposed to be in prayer in about five minutes. So how about we just pray with some people at our table? And we'll just have our time of prayer. Just turn to someone and pray there. And you have about 15 minutes. And we did include in this booklet for you. Maybe we can discuss, um, if you want to discuss the questions from Glennis on there, you can do that. We included in here a great other thing we were going to do in our groups today. Um, but we had way too much fun in here. And that is why Thanksgiving is important. So this is another thing that you can do. It tells you the directions on um, one through four, and it's going through Psalm 100 on Thanksgiving. So this would be another fun thing just to do um, as you um, as you go through it. And the directions, it's pretty self-explanatory. You get to pull out some colored pencils, and you can ask your leaders for help. But we really don't have time to even get to our groups at um, at this point. I will just double check our time. No, because we're supposed to be praying at 1130. So we have 15 minutes, so just turn in your groups and enjoy getting to know some other ladies. And thank you all for coming out for the Refresh and Connect. It has been a blessing.